Hello, welcome to MICA's Lunch and Learn webinar. I'm Karen Everett, Vice President of Risk Management Services. With me is Jeremy Hodder, Supervisor, Risk Management Services, and Sue Jones, Senior Risk Management Consultant. Thank you for joining us today. You are on the front line of this national health emergency and the end and the result are uncertain. We hope today's information and the resources on the MICA website help you effectively manage your practice or office during this stressful time. So let's get started. Risk management responses to coronavirus. Our hotline has been busy with calls and emails related to the coronavirus outbreak and the announcement of the public health emergency. We at MICA thought you might benefit from hearing the questions and our answers. We'll continuously monitor and update our resources and information as necessary. The biologic and epidemiologic and clinical data on coronavirus and COVID-19 is rapidly evolving or advancing. Today's information may be outdated tomorrow. Local, state, and federal announcements, guidelines, and regulations are frequently updated, sometimes within hours. Check your resources before making final decisions or implementing new policies, procedures, and processes. Okay. Uh, as Karen said, we've had a number of questions on our hotline, which, uh, by the way, is not just for emergent issues, it's for anything that you need to talk to us in risk management and micro for. Um, one of the questions we had was a uh, patient is uh, refusing hospitalization due to coronavirus risk and prefers to stay at home with non medical assistance. Uh, so, what do we do about that? Well, obviously, we would suggest uh, looking at the patient's risk factors as a first first off. Um, obviously, patients have a choice about their medical care, um, but it's important that you know we relay the uh, the appropriate information to patients about uh, hospital care and how hospitals are dealing with these situations, and PPE and et cetera, et cetera, triaging. But uh, you know, it's it's important that you have that discussion with the patient or the patient's representatives about their risk factors and their choices and their options. Obviously within the informed consent is that risks, benefits and, and alternatives are presented to the patient so they can make that informed choice. But uh, yeah, as I say, discussion with the patient patient's relatives is, is, is so important in this and documentation of that discussion on from there. I think that uh, obviously we, we are always ask the questions, do I need to get the patient to sign an informed refusal? consent form, informed consent, sorry, refusal form. Um, and yes, yes, if you can get them to sign that, please do. But what we also say is uh, the, the quality of, uh, of the discussion, your discussion with the patient, the discussion and the documentation of that discussion is as important as getting the form signed or certainly if the form isn't signed. Another one of the patient uh, questions that we're getting on the hotline is about self-quarantine. Um, in particular, we had a uh, physician is on call, whether they're on call for their group, on call for the hospital, or wherever they're on call for, but they are returning from a country that was included in the coronavirus travel ban. They are asymptomatic, but following the CDC guidelines, they are self-quarantining themselves at home for the 14-day time frame. However, in this particular case, the physician is on call. What do they do? Our recommendations would be to either call the head of your group or the chief medical officer of the hospital explaining the situation, the reasons for why you're self-quarantining, and seeing if you can get some sort of coverage for yourself, um, uh, whether it's you have somebody in the group covering for you for the few days that you would have been the on-call physician, and then you cover for them, when your 14 day self-quarantine is over. Uh, another possible uh, option is also to see if you can get a locum tenens physician to fill in for that period of time. Obviously you would wanna use your best professional medical judgment 
um, and also keep in contact with the uh, with whatever state it is that you are working in, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, or Colorado, with the, your state um, public health department to see what the up-to-date screening and testing processes are. This is Karen. Sometimes the decision to self-quarantine might bring up questions about the physicians, nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, or physician's assistants contract with a group or a hospital, or questions about medical staff membership and um, bylaws. Would it be helpful for physicians and advanced healthcare professionals to talk with their personal counsel about the management of any contractual or bylaws issues? Absolutely, I agree with you 100%, Karen. They definitely should. I think in these particular cases, what we're hearing now is this is all, for lack of a better word, novel. Uh, right now, these situations are arising that have probably have never been come up before. People have not even thought of these types of issues coming up. So they're being caught basically with what do I do in the moment right now. But I would highly suggest, as you said, that they, if this becomes a problem and it's a matter of just the physician staying and continue to um, keep themselves quarantined, or do they go in against their best judgment, they probably should have a conversation with them as well. Absolutely. Um, so the next question uh, that we've received on the hotline, I say one of many, uh, is, is regarding cancelled elective surgeries. So the hospital has cancelled elective surgeries. Uh, patients are not deemed urgent or emergent by the hospital, but the physician believes immediate care is necessary to avoid future problems. So what do you do about this? I think obviously there, there obviously is an issue of the physician's professional med medical judgment, you know, the clinical judgment as to the urgency of this case and whether anything can be delayed. One suggestion we've made is that uh, to look for any other options, is it possible to use a, an ambulatory surgery center? Is there a colleague in your group that you can hand over to that, that has privileges or some, somewhere else that managed to get this patient in somewhere? Again, discussion, discussion with the patient or the patient's representative is, is sort of at most here and documentation of discussion of that discussion. Um, is there medical management possible? Is it possible to manage this patient in any other way apart from uh, the immediate surgery that the physician deems is necessary? That's something else to look at. And not, and not a lot of the other calls that we're getting to um, becoming more and more popular calls are the risk of transmission in the office or the practice setting. Um, and so we've got calls uh, where employees are concerned about coming to work and are they going to be uh, exposed to patients who are coming in off the street, not knowing that the person is positive for the coronavirus. Um, there's also concern of patient to patient transmission. So any type of ways that you can uh, do it. What we're recommending a lot is, um, and most of this is coming from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control um, and the World Health Organization. These are not micro recommendations. These are uh, medical professional recommendations from the federal governments. Basically, the first thing we want to do is telephone triage. If you know your patients have scheduled appointments that you would want to make sure that you give them a call and find out if they or anybody in their family is currently sick with basically those three conditions, cough, shortness of breath, or sore throat, which is obviously expanding as this uh, continues to expand throughout the country. So you want to telephone triage. If you can keep them from coming in if they are ill, unless they absolutely need to be seen. Um, you want to also make sure that if a person comes in off the street, so to speak, or is a walk-in, you were unaware of was coming in, and they are symptomatic or appear to be symptomatic with a respiratory condition, that you, you know, per the CDC, you mask them immediately. Um, have have these staff wear don protective personal equipment, you know, gloves, gowns, mask themselves. Um, you want to isolate the patient if or the visitor that's with them, if possible. Um, and also to, um, to, to keep them away from the other patients or visitors that are in the, um, in the office with you. You want to also document, um, document the discussion with the patient or the patient's representative as to the steps that you are taking. And also offer, if you can, um, prior to a patient coming in, 
seeing if you if you are set up to do telehealth or telemedicine, if they would be willing to consent to have the visit done virtually. Another question we are getting is about, um, you know, bring, like I said, bringing people in with them and then they are testing positive after the fact. So we did have one call where the, the wife of a patient was uh, in getting a blood draw. The patient's husband was currently getting tested. They didn't know the outcome of the test at that time. She had gloves on, the medical system drawing the blood, but had no other protective equipment on. The patient was in the office for about a 20 minute time frame. Later that day, they got the results that of the patient's husband coming back positive for coronavirus. The wife, who is the patient, was going to get tested, but at this time they did not know whether she was positive or negative. And the concern was for what do they do with the employee? The patient also had, um, was, had been interacting with other people in the office. So these are no easy questions to answer as to how to handle these. Um, but again, we had the potential for, you know, one person infecting several other people in a doctor's office. So uh, in this particular case, again, we suggested that, you know, since the employee at that time was uh, symptomatic, the Arizona Department of Health at that time was not testing people who are asymptomatic, but that can change, okay, just as the, um, the reasons for testing are changing as we speak. So we often suggest if you run into situations like these, you pick up the phone and call, you know, whoever your state public health department is, local public health department is, find out what's going on, what are the testing processes, um, and what is their guidance. We're seeing recommendations from Centers for Disease Control, state departments of health, the World Health Organization, about personal protective equipment. And often the recommendation is to provide it to staff. We're also hearing from our member practices and physicians that they've called places and they cannot get the personal protective equipment. Um, any ideas on other organizations or agencies they might try uh, to secure this um, equipment for their offices? Again, Karen, there's no easy answer to this. Um, I do believe when President Trump declared the national emergency last Friday and opened that up in the FEMA that released things that are what they call stockpiled for situations just like this, like protective, personal protective equipment. How much is out there, we don't know. Um, and also we are hearing just you know, through the news and through the CDC and World Health Organization, they are asking um, American companies who don't normally um, produce this kind of equipment to, to, to step up and do it. Um, I believe President Trump just signed in to law the, I can't uh, think of the name of it, uh, but it, it's an act that uh, does, does this, that allows companies to start producing mass quantities of things that are needed in situations like pandemic. Um, I don't know how fast they can produce this equipment, but they are saying, the CDC is saying that that the protective health, in, uh, protective health in equipment should be used for healthcare prof professionals first and patients second. Now, obviously, if a patient comes in symptomatic and you need to put a mask on them, that is something you're doing for safe patient care and, and, and your employees as well. But I don't think there's an answer to this. Our recommendation is that just, just be in contact with your local vendors that you're using um, and to do it pretty much on a daily basis because they might not have supplies as of yesterday, but they might get them in today. And my guess is it will be first come first serve as it is with what we're seeing with a lot of things. So we just recommend that you stay in contact with um, you know, your local vendors to see how, how and when you can get this, these, this type of equipment. So what if your practice has decided we want to continue to take care of our established patients? We want to try to make patient care and treatment work, but we also want to protect our staff and other patients who might be in the office. We want to move to telehealth or telemedicine visits or perhaps telephone appointments. 
we're not refusing to take care of our patients. We're asking them to please help us honor the Centers for Disease Control, the Department of Health, and the World Health Organization's recommendations and have implemented virtual visits where we can. Patients are still demanding to be seen in the office. What can we say? What can we tell these patients? That's been a call we've been receiving. And I think the first step is to let the patient or patient representative know when they're on the phone with you that at this time, in um, order to try to prevent the transmission of coronavirus, you're seeing patients in the office when it's medically necessary. Otherwise, you're managing patient care by telephone or telemedicine. Make it clear to the patient or the patient's representative that you're not refusing to treat them. Then here's where the physician's medical judgment, the nurse practitioners, the nurse midwives, the physician's assistant's professional judgment comes into play. Is this a patient that needs to be seen in person or can be managed remotely? If it is a patient that needs to be seen in the office, you can make arrangements to somehow see this patient, meet them somewhere, and still protect your staff and others who might be in the office. This also might be a time to consider telephone and telemedicine visits. So it's important that the patients hear the message from you. You're not refusing to see them. You're not refusing to take care of them, but you need to take care of them in a new or different way while this national health emergency remains in place. Another frequent call that we are getting is where the patient's family is brought along for the appointment. As we all know, <clears throat> as a, in Arizona, um, as of Sunday night, Doug, uh, Governor Ducey had all schools close for at least the next two weeks. Um, and so that meant schools and daycares were closed. And so people are having difficulty finding childcare for their children, um, whether it's to go to work, come into the doctor's office or whatever. Um, there are a couple of changes. Uh, I did listen to Doug, uh, Governor Ducey's speech yesterday where they're saying that potentially school systems in Arizona can be closed for a, you know even a month or two months, even maybe throughout the year as of June. Uh, stay tuned for that. So this is obviously a situation that's putting a lot of people um, in a hard way in order to you know, go to work and do what they need to do. So what's happening is we're seeing doctor's offices, um, they're showing up with their children. Um, one of the things, again, we would suggest that you do is if you know they're coming in for an appointment is to call them in advance and find out if anybody in the family is sick or has any kind of symptoms um, and to recommend that they either leave them with a neighbor or someone in the household if they can. Um, if they just show up on your doorstep um, and you have a symptomatic child that you again would do the same thing for a patient where you would mask that patient and isolate them from other patients and visitors. Um, you obviously want to discuss this with the patient um, um, and also documentation of what you did to handle that patient. I do know as of yesterday the Arizona Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA are stepping up to offer free babysitting services, I believe free of charge to help folks in certain areas of Arizona that are having difficulty finding childcare. 
And I also believe that there are, um, from what you were telling me, Karen, there are daycares that are starting to reopen in order to help with this, um, in order to play their part in this by helping provide childcare, especially for healthcare workers that need to get to their job. So again, we want you to document that discussion, try to triage as best you can to keep the sick people or the sick children uh, or family members out of the office. But sometimes they're gonna just unfortunately show up on your doorstep and then you'll have to triage it as um, in the moment. Uh, up until this national health emergency, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid has had um, limited um, coverage for telemedicine and the use of health technology. Some visits in some areas were covered, others were not. As a result of this outbreak and the need for remote services, CMS has broadened the definition of telemedicine and health technology and it may make taking care of your elderly patients um, more productive and more efficient. And always, if you have questions about telemedicine, you're welcome to call the risk management hotline and the underwriting customer service line. So yeah, as, as Karen said, um... I think the government are certainly making inroads into uh, increasing the uh, the use of uh, telemedicine or telehealth. Uh, There's a very telling statement from uh, Roger Severino, who's the uh, director of the uh, Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights, said yesterday, uh, we're empowering medical providers to serve patients wherever they are during this national public health emergency. We're especially concerned about reaching those most at risk, including older persons and persons with disabilities. So um, the, the, what's happened well, the, recently, as I say yesterday, was that um, the OCR have sort of uh, laxed the rules slightly uh, to allow uh, the HIPAA rules slightly to allow uh, practitioners out there to, uh, to communicate with patients and provide telehealth services through remote telecommunication technologies. Um, they are appreciative that those certain uh, technologies, those platforms that are in use may not fully comply with the requirements of HIPAA rules. So on from there, they've uh, decided that they will, the OCR will exercise its enforcement discretion and will not impose penalties for non-compliance with the regulatory requirements under HIPAA rules uh, against covered healthcare providers in connection with good faith provision of telehealth during uh, this national public health emergency. Uh, what they have said is that, that um, practitioners out there can use any non-public, and I emphasize that non-public, uh, remote communication product that is available out there. Um, so that uh, basically anything to do with video chatting can work and, and, and will work, um, but I say it must be sort of non-public facing. So they're saying things like Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger video chat, Google Hangouts video, or even Skype. Uh, is allowable at this present time. They're also saying any telephone communication as well. It doesn't have to be a purely a visual um, product platform. Uh, but uh, obviously, as we always suggest here at MICA, we, we encourage uh, practitioners out there to notify patients that uh, the third party applications that uh, you may be using in telemedicine and telehealth um, could potentially introduce uh, privacy risks and um, providers should enable um, all in available encryption and privacy modes when using such uh, applications. Um, as I say, public facing, uh, non-public facing, public facing um, things like Facebook Live, Twitch and TikTok are not really uh, appropriate under these and we would suggest that they aren't used for, for um, medical communication with these patients. Um, obviously, there are any uh, additional privacy protections are available through uh, the standard platforms that are um, HIPAA compliant and have business associate agreements uh, related to them. Things like Skype for Business and uh, Doxy.me, Zoom for Healthcare, uh, Google G Suite Hangouts Meet, these all uh, have be business associate agreements linked to them. Um, however, interestingly, uh, we were notified by a colleague yesterday that uh, Doxy.me 
uh, usually has practitioners sign up of around two to three thousand practitioners per month but yesterday they were hitting about two and a half thousand per hour so they were having huge uh, connectivity issues but um, I think uh, one of the questions we've had is, is that um, is consent required for telehealth and we do recommend informed consent um, and we will be posting uh, a sample consent form on our website pretty soon um, and also we suggest that, that any practitioners out there will obviously look at any state licensing laws regarding the practice of medicine within the states that they are practicing in. Um, and we will be posting a document on um, telemedicine visits to the website again pretty soon. Jeremy, can yeah. I also just interject something? Please um, do. These um, video applications that currently are allowed during the pandemic uh, once the Secretary for Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, lifts the epidemic ban or comes from President Trump or whoever, uh, all bets are off, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So these non-HIPAA compliant services you're currently using in order to practice good faith medicine to handle patients during this pandemic, you will have to, if you're going to continue telemedicine practices, to actually go with a, an, um, an application that is HIPAA compliant, encrypted, and has a business associate agreement so we just want to let our callers know that that um, they cannot continue to use you know say FaceTime or Skype after that period of time we're also getting questions about can you be reimbursed CMS has just put out some guidance and we would suggest you just go to the cms.gov website in order to see they put up frequently asked questions about how they are paying um, and the codes to be using for telemedicine virtual telephone visits or with your patients through patient portals um, but we also caution that your billers also speak with your private insurers to make sure that the codes that the CMS is providing are the ones that they will be providing so that you get paid as well. Okay thanks for that Sue. Um, yeah, just some important resources that we have and something that Karen mentioned at the beginning of the presentation is that we, we recommend that everybody out there uh, keeps in touch uh, here in Arizona um, azdhs.gov and they have um, a uh, novel coronavirus hotline that anybody can call practitioners or public and that's the number they're toll free it's is 844-542-8201 and in Utah uh, they have a coronavirus uh, information line which is hosted by the Department of Health there and again toll free number 800-456-7707 and that's uh, https coronavirus.utah.gov we're at the end of our time, but we still have many questions left to answer. We'll be making answers to those questions available on the MICA website, along with recording and handout materials for this webinar. Uh, please look for those in 24 to 48 hours. We thank you for your time and attention. Um, we thank you for being on the front line of this crisis and taking care of our nation's patients.